today's uh, reading. Really exciting to, to kind of have um, our brilliant um, poets with us uh, today. And, um, you know, uh, thanks for everyone who came, came along and uh, signed up. So um, um, today I, I really um, love the idea of um, exploring language um, with um, uh, Cynthia, uh, Jason, Sean, and uh, Romlin, because um, I think their work really um, help us to think a lot more about the meaning of language and how actually um, the different languages and how they kind of weave in and out with each other and, um, it, you know, let us rethink, you know, what's that uh, makes us um, help understand or connect with each other and uh, can, uh, connect with each other's identities as well. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to it. And um, so today, I think, um, first of all, we're really excited to um, uh, hear from Cynthia and she's really generous in um, giving us, uh, uh, you know, like her, from her newest work <laughs> and uh, congratulations to you on launch uh, the, the book, uh, the new book honorifics. So, um, just a very brief introduction, because um, I'm sure that lots of you know Cynthia very well. So uh, Cynthia is, um, she's a Malaysian American poet um, and also an innovation consultant and festival producer living in Edinburgh. And she co-founded the Firth Poetry Festival, which all of us know about, so it's an amazing festival. And she's also on the advisory board of um, the sister publishing house, Firth Poetry Press. And I'm sure that you have loads of the Fair Poetry books um, at home as well. Um, her debut collection, Honorifics, it's an amazing book and is coming out in June 2021 with Nine Arches. Um, in 2017, she was one of the winners of Primus as well, which is a you know, leading mentorship program led by Poetry School and Nine Arches Press. And I believe she still has uh, lots of things uh, going on and, you know, really wonderful works out there in lots of magazines. And um, so I would be really delighted to hand over the stage to um, Cynthia and hear her, how her work engage us with language. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks so much, Jenny. Um, and hi everyone, it's it's lovely to see you. Thanks so much for dialing in on a Saturday. I'm really delighted to be reading with Sean and Jason, and I'm sure Rumlin will pop along in a second. Um, and I just, I love the theme of this event, language. It definitely permeates a lot of my kind of thinking and writing. So um, I'm just gonna start with a poem um, that was written actually on a poetry school course that Nina Mingya Powell's led in January. She's so good. She's such a good tutor. And um, the course, one of our prompts for one week was, was thinking about, yeah, about language and whether or not we dream in other languages. So I just thought that was a delicious prompt. Um, this is Dream Vending Machine. I feed it coins and watch the spring coil back. The clunk of a vacuum packed foil wrapped dream dropping into the tray. It dispenses all kinds of dreams. Wet dreams, good dreams, short nightmares to stave off worse ones. Recurring dreams with a marshmallow center hard-boiled caramel dreams to tuck in your cheek, a bag of orange dreams with Spanish subtitles. One neon sachet promises conversational Cantonese while you sleep. Another is a dream of the inside of a river, slips down like sardines in oil, pulls my body long and sleep to chatter about currents to any otter that would listen. My favorite dream is always out of stock effortless Parisian Berlin. In that one, I'm nibbling tiny cakes. I'm making small talk about expensive eye creams in a French pharmacy. I'm pressing my hand to the door buzzer of a top floor flat in which there is a fantastic party that's expecting me. Zero sugar dreams never last long. There's one pale pink dream I avoid. It fizzes like Pepto-Bismol flavored pixie sticks. It's processed in a factory that also handles hope, shame, and other allergens. That dream is like accidentally stepping on a cat, sudden and awful, heart-wrenching for everyone. In it, my, my father says, I'm sorry I never call. I never know what to say. 
And I finally have the words to reply, don't worry. And I know. And hey, we're good. We're good now. We're all good. Um, this next poem is a praise poem. It's called Malaysiana. And it's, um, I guess, yeah, an ode to um, where I was born and where the, my mother's side of the family is from, which is in Kuching in Malaysia. <clears throat> Early morning blessing of hawkers slinging noodles, every face a sun through clouds of starchy steam, reservoir park at dawn, clouds behind Fort Marguerite, a small sugared cake on the riverbank, everyday things, motorbikes gut gut guttering, out of season things, spiky knuckle duster of durian, the suddenness of sunrise on the equator, you turn away for a second and bam, it's filling the whole room. Love, there's no such thing as empty space in 100% humidity. Daytime radio, canto popsicle melting from an open car window, yellow spine Nancy Drew books handed down, wet kitchens, wet market with their own gravity, exoplanet of ice and fish and tumble of fruit, hibiscus tea, cats insistent at the back gate, the geometric delight of layer quay, dipper baths twice daily, five foot way between a shop and the street where someone is cutting their neighbor's hair, a whole street of old fashioned goldsmiths, my parents' parents wore hangover, talking about eating when we're not yet finished with this meal. Boiled peanuts, Chinese opera, friends' houses where we don't call ahead, but they know we're coming anyways. Slow river sachet. Wet laundry like diligent flowers following the morning sun and marble topped kopitiam tables. Streets where you recognize everyone and call out to each other, How's your mother? I saw your cousin the other day playing badminton. When are we going for Louis Cha? Streets you can navigate with your eyes closed. A kumquat tree we watered for months, not knowing it was plastic. Chinese moms don't say, I love you. They cut fruit for dessert, press gold earrings into your palm, buy 30 kilos of ginger and cook all of your postpartum confinement meals for a month, no questions asked. Hand washing our clothes every morning makes us glad to be in our skin. So, from Malaysia, shall we travel thousands of miles to the UK? Um, this next poem is after Caroline Bird, who is an unbelievable poet. And if you don't have her latest collection, The Air Year, what are you doing? It's amazing. Um, so this is a poem after Caroline Bird, but the just as a bit of context, the last line in this poem is a line that goes, nobody necessarily stays anywhere forever. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with that phrase, it was something that former PM Theresa May said on a, on a Sky interview, um, I think during like the leadership elections, when she was asked about immigration post-Brexit. And she said, nobody necessarily stays anywhere forever when talking about kind of immigration policy and reform. What a phrase. The Home Office. The motivational poster that says, I want you to make this environment more hostile. The hallway that elongates like an infernal scream. The doors that open onto the room you just exited the stairwell that spits you out in another country, the anonymous senior source that leaks the story to the Sunday papers, who is in the archives wading knee deep through documents that don't officially exist, who takes a long drag of a cigarette and says, landing cards, why I haven't heard that phrase in years, who clicks a lighter under the sprinklers, who switches on industrial grade shredders, who dumps passports by the box into a bathtub of lime green acid, whose daily stroll along the Thames makes fish swim backwards and belly up, who loves the smell of closed borders in the morning, who chants best and brightest 
in the mirror three times with the lights off. He was replacing all of your framed photos with glassy eel eyes that scuttle over the floorboards at night. Who doesn't see the irony in the phrase, leave to remain? Who was flipping a coin to decide your settled status? Heads we win, tails you lose. Who feeds your house keys to a pet alligator to see how bad you want them back? Who paints miniature houses like a Christmas village and displays them in a locked trophy case? Mementos of all the homes we loved and lived in, or might have lived in, or dreamt of, or passed through, or were evicted from, or ran towards, or put up with. Who cheerfully mails you postcards that say, wish you were here, after deporting you. Who scooped out a whale like a rotting pumpkin, and stuffed it with infrared trackers, and launched it back into the channel to alert them to foreign bodies in the sea. Who thinks of all this dark, dark water? Who believes that someone, somewhere, somehow, isn't where they should be, and it's up to the home office to do something about it. No doubt there's a boat clawing its way to shore right at this very moment. You see, nobody necessarily stays anywhere forever. Mm. Um, this next poem I've been writing a lot about water and being by the sea um, so this next this next poem is called a bridge dictionary for water babies um, and almost if you imagine the way that a dictionary is laid out kind of the noun and then a little description to the right hand side that's kind of what that's what I was picturing. Um, a bridge dictionary for water babies. Fur, pine honey is salt sap, bark treacle, sharper and greener and colder than anything collected from inland hives. Moon, jellied eye fish, prized delicacy, unblinking above dark cliffs. Salt, Salt line, salt circle, salt crust, salt glaze, salt water. Selkie, I am forever half one thing, half something else. If I chanted selkie like a spell enough times, I could wriggle into it like a nylon dress. I am wringing out my skin until the whole house smells like engine oil, seaweed, a promise tomorrow. Water. Even as we were in it, we longed to be in it, forever sculling between shallows and the ocean floor, dropping away into dark blue, sea greedy, our weird tan lines, our vaseline armpits. Storm. All summer long, the small boat of my heart takes on water. Venus. Lisa stepped out in a gold sequin swimsuit like a rock star. The whole boat screamed in delight. Where do you even get a suit like that? She even brought an inflatable scallop shell. Everything matched. Her sun lightened curls, glitter nails, glitter sunglasses. We sat around like lesser nymphs in our plain wetsuits. It was like looking straight into the sun and she goddamn knew it. Uh, I'll end on um, one poem that is forthcoming in my new book. It's not yet published, otherwise I've held it up like this. Um, I read a lot about, yeah, reimagining mythology and Greek myths and all of that. Um, this is Moon Goddess Guzzle. A man walks into the forest for the last time. The air smells portentous like wet dog, and he moons over me, dumbstruck. In paintings, I'm always startled and doe shy, a naked slip of crescent moon. Now dryads are catcalling in the trees. No, they're whistling his deer hounds to their dinner. Under this petty moon, honey burns, mint curdles, 
I'm one long nettle scream. Sorry for the abject chaos, I needed the attention. Full moon craziness is licking lightning or unzipping your sternum to find a black bear baying. Good moon goddesses aren't meant to wear lycra shorts under dresses, shed antlers, talk back to the dark. I'm moonlighting under one of my lesser names these days. Cynthia, tell us what quickens in the night. Blood, hunger, a hunter's moon. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to Jenny. Thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for your um, wonderful work. It's just really, what a treat. I just think like, um, you know, there's such, um, you know, like when you, your, the, the, um, your poems always uh, reveal like so much, um, you know, there's so much inventiveness in your language and how like, it, there's this sense of humor and observation and precision. Um, I really enjoy, you know, every time I read your work um, in magazines and in the, your new poems, they always like feel there's a, such originality with the way that you kind of put things together. And it's also lovely to, to see that narrative of your heritage kind of like um, told in these uh, poems. So um, thank you very much. It's wonderful for the treat. And I put, um, for those of us um, who have, uh, haven't got the copy yet, um, please uh, remember the honorific's coming soon and um, please order your, your own personal copy. Um, so um, I think like um, next we will have, um, we're very happy to have Jason with us and um, Jason Lee from Hong Kong. And again, um, thanks to technology, really um, what a treat to have you here together in this whole space. Um, so Jason is a poet and academic of uh, mixed British and Chinese ancestry. And he works, uh, his research and practice um, um, encompass global Anglophone literatures um, post-colonial and diaspora um, Asian writing, as well as global Shakespeare um, literature. So his um, debut poetry collection, Bets in the East, was published by Eyewear Press in 2019. He is a literary editor for post-colonial text and chief curator um, for Out Lao Hong Kong, which is a monthly group of longstanding um, poetry collective. He lectures um, uh, in English at Hong Kong Baptist University. So let's welcome Jason. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's good afternoon to you guys. It's good evening for me. It's uh, about 11.15. I've got my son hopefully asleep in his bedroom. Uh, more likely he's playing on the iPad, but um, we'll just continue anyway. So it's, as I said to, um, to, the, to the poets um, when we very briefly met, um, it's a rare privilege for me because I have both friends and um, fellow Hong Kongers here, but I also have in Cynthia and Lisa, um, fellow Malaysian, Chinese, um, stroke British um, friends. So what I'll do then, I suspect probably Jenny's put me after Cynthia so I can kind of um, follow on from some, some of those lovely poems about um, Kuching and Sarawak uh, and possibly preempt some of the other poems that Sean might, um, might, might recite. So my book, Beds in the East, is, is interesting because it's, uh, is interesting because it's, it's a two-part um, collection. The first half is about my childhood in Malaysia, um, and the second half is really my kind of um, adolescence and the rites of passage of, of growing up in Essex. So the two flavors are very different, but what I'll do is I'll try to break it down more or less evenly, and then I'll finish with a poem more recently about Hong Kong. Um, I do want to finish with Hong Kong because I think there's a lot to say um, and hopefully it will be a, a kind of calling card for what may emerge from Hong Kong poets um, in the near future. So this is a kind of response to um, Cynthia's uh, Malaysian, what's it called, Malaysian, I think it was. Um, <clears throat> this poem is the title of the collection, Beds in the East, um, and I'll just read it. Beds in the East. Curiosity buzzed by on flimsy dragonfly wings to take a child through his first prodigal flight, lifting him across shrieking floorboards, gangly porches, past scalding words to pry outside among the world. There, 
The streets jostled for space to spread welcome sights. A blue shawl pressed its velvet lights across the fence and smiled, idling by rows of whitewashed houses that winked and crowned the inhabitants. Abdul, Rashid, Lim, D'Souza. Bicycles vaulted over potholes, swerved through split papaya. An old man lugged his wares down the road, keeping the dawn hours with his peeling cry. Dala, dala, his wheelbarrow of eggs hissing and popping from crates. As the muezzin raised his voice over minarets, a minor bird recited its sweet, faithful call back over the hill. The masjid reared its golden dome in wonder, while unbelievers sought out its high-pitched sound. Such days switched on rains that irked, then slushed a cold, rusty sound to send kids out with mugs and tin cups. The drains pattered and gushed aloud their complaint, but the streams, wheeled on by the children, kept flowing. This is how it opens up for me, the strains of another life. The land spread beneath me like a magic carpet. A mother who pointed and said, child, do not be afraid, who picked me up and showed me, curled up in her arms, the quayside rolling westward in the beckoning surf, the sea gypsies roaming by on waves, invincible, the quiet streets naming one by one the world's children, and a lone dragonfly, euphoric, rising with the morning sun. So this poem is really um, kind of snapshot of the very multi-racial, multicultural upbringing that I had in, in Borneo. And what the collection gradually does is it, is it takes a slightly Malthusian rationale in looking at how um, one tries to make sense of this very beautiful um, exotic landscape. So the next poem that I'll read is Reflesia. And Reflesia, if, if you don't know already, is um, technically the largest flower, but it's also one that um, feeds on dead um, flies and animals. Reflesia. I stuttered through each syllable that spiked and bloomed from the undergrowth of my tongue and cleared the space around it. Ra, flesh, ah. Mm. Books told me it was the largest flower, but I saw through its disguise, sucking up the moist air and gurgling its threats to me, spurting out its effluvia onto vines that ran across feet, rising as fungi. Folk warned me not to stray too far from paths where it lay dormant, steaming and rotting. Its pockmarked leather hide hunched itself up in a flurry of stench and carrion, waiting to draw some curious child in with its rimmed mouth, beckoning me to peer close like a fly into its tucked up folds. Yearly, we round through mountainside and parks while I recalled my list of brutish plants. The picture with its swelling gourd, gorging on its prey like a fat-bellied school kid, the spider orchids dangling red feelers over my unguarded back. But always, it was Reflesia I feared most of all. That day, I swore I'd approach the clearing and inform the crowd of its violent ways. But when I came upon its charred black bud, curled up as though fried and lynched by the sun, I weighed up my distaste for that crude plant and saw past its fitful aberration, thinking, Within this jungle's primal law, it was all a question of survival. So that, I've been told, is my kind of um, Seamus Heaney, death of a naturalist poem. You know, the kind of the ways in which nature um, comes alive and it's, it's violent, but it's beautiful. And, you know, it creates this kind of tension between nature and, and chaos. And what I wanted to do with that is I wanted to carry it through in such a way um, to make the, the Malaysian landscape not just purely exotic, but also something that can be um, that can be approached and imagined through the perspective of the, the local tribes people there. So in Borneo, we have not just the, the Malays, the Chinese, the Eurasians, um, the Tamils. We also have the indigenous people um, who could be Murut or Kadazanduzum. So what I what I have here is I have a poem that plays on and pays homage to one of the, the local myths um, based on the mountain, which is in Sabah, um, Mount Kinabalu. So it's called The Longhouse. 
between misty cloud and sea under the care of Aki Nabalu, ancestor mountain. The longhouse reclines upon its stools and basks in the lie of its land, observing the harvest as an old man. Running fingers along its grooved bark, slats creaking under wizened bark, it loosens the vines around its trunk to expand its knotted roots again, as yet another family comes to spread their bounty beneath its aging fronds. More hands to pound grain in the storehouse and sweep across the long corridor. It remembers once how, a young strapling out amongst fields, it dreamt of Puminodun and her sacrifice, saw a girl's reflection in the brooks and thought, she will be my harvest queen. She will grasp the paddy stalks under my possessive shade and soothe me at night with her lullabies. Now, its thatched roof swells, ruffles with the wind, as if to say, come, sit here and breathe through my wooden palms, inhale the smoky reeds and feast on papai with me. Listen to the pipes and drums falling. Forget the plantations, the veins of white satin gold, dance to the rich scene of my forebears. This is the life you have come for. Though others will stumble through these muddy fields, you will never leave. <clears throat> so this is based on the, the concept in the, the indigenous community of the longhouse. And you have these very, very long houses which house entire families from um, these tribes people. And they're situated deep in the Borneian rainforest. So I felt that I couldn't really write a collection without at least trying to represent or at least pay some kind of homage to, to these kinds of communities. I remember when, when Jenny invited me to this, she talked about this motif of finding language. And for me, what, what the collection does is it, it kind of narrates my own sense of viewing the world, using a mixture of Malay and, and other languages, but it's also about dealing with the, the tensions of being, as I think many of us will know, uh, mixed race. So what I have at the end of the collection is something that I think plays on the politics of misogyny that I think quite a number of our collections inevitably do. So I'll read this one for you. It's called simply Mutant. Forged by the world, but not of it. I am that most composite of creatures, your hybrid monster, chimera whose progeny you never planned. Away from your pregnant furnace, I clang and grip for a second birth. My mishappen figure lies heavy against the metallic faces of the earth. My heat was born on human hands. Now my blood will darken and congeal in embers of desire, then spill as love does across distant lands. I am nowhere, I am everywhere. No island is out of reach, no shore too distant. My every breath will slay the horizons. Airborne, I weld myself into arcs of light, split the sun's baptismal rays into rainbows. My prismatic gaze has set the world apart and dispersed the teeming multitudes. Resurrected daily, I stand poised above fields, casting myself over borders whose shadows flee with their armies into the night. I have spent an eternity in your midst, always a brief step from home. I wave at that unknown tribe on the margin, shaking loose my ancestors' limbs. No earth I inherit will take me back into its furnace now. Out of my one sun, will come a thousand burnished blades. Each child will singe within my flames. So there we are. That's, um, it's a poem that comes quite close to the end. Um, and it deals with this, this idea of being always stuck in between. Um, in some ways, I always felt like a mutant. So I was kind of playing on that. When I get towards the, the end of this collection, it's kind of goes full circle, but um, my kind of point of um, embarkation and disembarkation um, becomes Hong Kong, where, of course, where I'm residing now. 
So I have this poem that really speaks to this idea, I think, of um, what it's like to be um, Han, Han Chinese, and some of the problems that, that can come with that when you're dealing with an aggressive power that trades on Han ethno chauvinism. So this one is called Dragons Rising. They come flying across Asia skies, straddling great earthenware hills, paddling out of sunken depths and rousing eyelids from stumps of trees. Like great rivers, their torsos writhe and coil at every bend. Under each crevice, beside each faint shadow, they emerge from all the elements to speak to me. The greatest amongst them are flanked by crab-nosed guards from brittle glass palaces, who will order me to pay them homage with my hornless head hung low and my claws sheathed and bowed. I must pray for their benevolence, always obedient, never pleading for them to turn their gaze from me. They will hold me fast in their embrace, like a prodigal son newly returned, whisper at origins beyond the eastern seas and lash their tails across great continents, eager to measure their momentous tides with their old age wisdom and their charm, expecting to see their offspring running back in droves before their immortal eyes. They tell me I too can pass through this arched gateway to heavenly peace that my scales will glisten with pride again. Spewing up great mouthfuls of smoke, they tell me everything has changed. You are descended from dragons, they say, stretching their gleaming talons behind their backs. You belong to us now. So there's a couple of very clever hidden references. Um, the concept of descended from dragons is, is a term that's often used to talk about the Chinese people as a collective. Um, there might also be a kind of transliteration of a very famous place in Beijing in there somewhere. So that's, that's from Beds in the East. And what I'll do, I hope I have time, is to finish with um, a project that's quite important to me at this moment in time. Uh, and the reason for that is because Hong Kong is going through a lot of changes uh, very quickly. And a lot of people talk about how there's a lot of amnesia, people's collective memory is constantly changing because the city changes so very quickly. So in the 15, 16 years that I've lived in Hong Kong now, I've wanted to try and narrate this, this idea of how we try to narrate the Hong Kong story and how it's always going to be a difficult endeavor because of its colonial, post-colonial history because of the way in which the, the physicality of the city seems to be lifted up from, from its geography. And also because of um, recent, um, recent politics. So I've started this um, book length poem called The Lost City. And I started it way back in 2008. And I, I kind of go back to it every summer. But I think um, in the past couple of months, this, this project has taken on more and more urgency because we are being restricted in our abilities to actually um, go into the archives of Hong Kong. So I do want to get this finished and I do want to try and see how I can represent um, in some small way, my own way of reading and seeing um, Hong Kong all the way from the beginning. So there's a moment in, in the narrative where I talk about um, the first journey of the, the colonizer, the British, the Portuguese, to um, the likes of uh, Hong Kong and India. So I'll just give you this segment and I'll end on that. Start with a merchant banker in London who put up a great stink wherever he went, who promised to fight the right war, to fill the slow coffers up with pieces of eight, who funded larceny in the high seas and trusted his friends to split the sweepstakes who had plunged into uncharted waters, obtained colonies, a governorship, was granted special rights, a royal charter, and an honorable company was born. The navigator's compass spun its head, its magnetic eye whirled and blinked towards eastern seas, fixed on a new attraction. 
the flotilla spun on the Atlantic, then banked leeward, hurled out by the trade wind and guided by the sun's inclination to chase latitudes across a clear sky. And as the sextant held its blazing arc to shape and divide the far horizons, the astrolabe spoke of stars and omens. Lent the waterway of a sullen world, the clipper surged like a leviathan through the untamed seas, <coughs> its stuck nose prow jutting and leering <coughs> from foamy surf, its figurehead furnished into a scowl. Those inset brassy eyes spoke of cold mirth as the gleaming flanks of the ship fasted slowly and carefully, until a month later it sighted a morsel of land and gorged itself belly deep in the sand. First, it was a friendly call, provisions for the next journey, victuals, sustenance, a royal letter of introduction, then a trading post, a signed agreement, the right to explore the interior, then favorable terms, an audience with the ruler, permanent settlement, an armed intervention to protect trade. Then it was the right to collect taxes. After that, it was all death and taxes. The merchant's footfalls had softly padded the teak decks of East Indiamen brought in to avenge a black hole in their conscience. As the muddy banks of the Bengal coast glittered with musket balls and cannonade, the Nawab's bronze shackles clinked to a toast of glasses held by officers whose aid would usher in a century of trade, whose continued use of force would of late enact a tribute from a puppet state. All this was what the company had sought under white sails they came proffering peace, but when they shouldered barges into port, held them at a choke point and closed the seas, they took a toll on those whose livelihoods had survived centuries of monsoon tides. The high ground was seized, forts were hewn from stone, and islands broken into chains that stretched the world's oceans and brought a pall of sails that draped the sea lanes like a string of pearls. Those ships, whose access to goods were purloined and ferried from port, circled their items to a bruised stamping of monarchs on coins. The East Indian currency, whose embossed designs were lifted from the Mughal courts, spread round and round, a simple transaction of weight to balance the company's books and entice the trader's reluctant hand, whose freighted goods broke a monopoly on clothes, nutmeg, cloth, imported silk, tea, the clerks would count the cost of such journeys from one passage to the next, knowing that their stock would rise and equity would flow as silver contained in the holds below waited in their journey across the globe. London to Freetown, the Cape Colony, through Zanzibar and the Arabian Sea, to Aden, then Ceylon and Calcutta, past the Bay of Bengal to Malacca, and finally, the Pearl Delta, Canton. So this is just one 80th of, of the poem so far. Um, it's a kind of epic narrative, but I'm sure I'm, I'm gonna make it slightly more lyrical and slightly more um, sensitive in places. Um, that's all I have for today. I, I look forward to hearing what the rest of you guys come up with. Thank you so much, guys. Back to you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, it was brilliant. Um, and also, uh, thanks for sharing your latest work uh, with us on archive and um, very uh, best of luck to, to you on that. And uh, which is a very important thing to, um, in terms of poetry of witness and, um, and really enjoyed also um, hearing your work again um, from your collection and uh, on, you know, how you kind of encompass uh, the language or the voices of different generations. Um, thank you, Jason. Um, so now we will um, probably welcome a few um, of our poets um, in our pop-up <laughs> open mic session. And um, I think um, it will be a good chance um, today to 
you know, like, um, so since a lot, uh, some of our really good poets are here, I um, want to invite them to uh, join us in exploring um, the idea of language and beyond. So I'm um, really honored to have Alice, Alice Hiller, um, and who, who has featured in one of our past events as well, but she, because she has her uh, latest collection out, uh, Bird of Winter, um, many of you have uh, probably gone to her launch as well, which is a brilliant, um, collection on uh, poetry, witnessing and redemption, language of redemption. So um, um, Alice, um, I think uh, we don't need any introduction for you. Like we see you, um, your, your, your work, it's just so poignant and I really welcome you to um, share with us some of your new work. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Great. Um, that was really, I'm sorry, I've walked in from the rain, walking my dog in Brompton Cemetery, so I'm a bit bedraggled, um, but, but very, very honoured. I was listening to you in my headphones while I was walking in the rain, which was very beautiful. Um, it's amazing to hear Cynthia's poems, to hear Jason's poems. I love both of your work. It really impacts me. I was born in Singapore. I was looked after by a Hong Kong Chinese armour whose love really was the foundation of my whole life. And so, although I have no ethnic connections with your part of the world, I have a very strong heart connection. And, um, and I just, what I was also sort of picking up on what Jason was saying and about making language, speaking a history with regards to Hong Kong and to working with the archives. And as some of you know, my work at the moment is responding to my experience of being groomed and sexually abused as a child and finding my way towards healing. The two poems I'm going to read should not be triggering, so I hope everyone's going to feel safe. But they're from when I was a teenager and when I had anorexia. And I was abused in the late 60s, in the 70s, with these the sort of full on abuse. Sexual abuse really wasn't known or talked about at that time. And I had no language for saying what to do, what was being done to me until my body invented a language and the language was simply not eating. And I managed to go from Easter to September, October. My weight went down to four and a half stone, which is I think 28.5 kilos. I was 13, so that is belts and skinny um, with, you know, kind of bones everywhere. And um, the two poems I'm going to read are um, about that period in my life. And the first one's called Primary or Classical Anorexia and it takes its name from the medical definition for anorexia, and it interleaves my own feelings with a translation of a text by one of the psychiatrists who treated me, and I've translated it into a sort of bird imagery, um, but that's what I'm going to read first. And it's, this is Primary or Classical Anorexia, 1977. In the dark, Sparrow, becomes clever and pretty. Feather by feather plucked, recovery is easier for fledglings. Some nights tore, starvation sows fine down over her body, carried away, made to keep still, tranquilizers improve eating and sleeping. Her clawed breast would regrow. Psychosexual conflict is inadmissible and unseemly. And the next poem I'm going to read is called Tessellation. And this remembers when I was actually in the hospital fairly heavily drugged as was the case in those days and not able to speak of what happened to me but nonetheless feeling a movement of change a movement of possibility a movement of opening and it's going to be my own words and at the very end I'm going to read some words from my medical notes which I've partially managed to recover and that's what made me think about Jason and the archives. Tessellation from her bed in the white cloud, Alice watches the commode she uses as a toilet. It is three steps away, 
but cannot be mentioned. She has not been allowed out of this room since she arrived. Pills drop her into nothing at night and hollow out her days. The doctor asks if Alice is feeling better. Alice thinks about the menu cards they make her fill. Within the leather armchair, the doctor's thighs spread warmed marzipan. Alice says she's getting used to being here. The doctor's hair is pulled back into a bun. She suggests that after Alice leaves the hospital, she could travel to the desert and learn Arabic. Alice imagines tents and camels and cushions with tiny mirrors. The doctor lights her cheroot, filling Alice's lungs with heavy candy floss. The doctor says, you must understand you're not your mother. You can only get well if you move far away from her. As the doctor speaks, Giant scissors snip around the window. Once these scissors have cut all the way round the flame, Alice rises up light as a leaf. Cold air is lifting her out into the waiting sky. Alice, both physically and mentally, is much less depressed and more outgoing. I think she is beginning. Letter, Alice Hiller Medical Notes, 1st of November, 1977. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alice. This is uh, brilliant, um, brilliant to hear from you and such poignant um, language and so intimate. And, um, Kind of painful as well. Um, thank you very much. Um, and um, yeah, rem for those of you, um, I put down the link for Bird of Winter. Um, yeah, this is brilliant. I hastily found it to read out of. <laughs> Congratulations again. So thank you um, so much. If um, maybe next we can have um, I think Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey, would you be able to read um, one of your poems for, for us as well? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Jenny. This is a real honor uh, to read with all of you, and especially with um, Alice, who's been a good friend and um, mentor through um, the past years. Um, I, I'm going to read a poem from a sequence in my um, my pamphlet, um, Dear Friends, which, I have here, <laughs> um, which was published a few years ago by the Emma Press. Um, these poems came out of, um, of an environment, my childhood actually, um, where language, <clears throat> spoken language and actually um, touch were very much withheld. Um, thus the title of the sequence is Gallery. And <clears throat> excuse me, this is the first of the poems, it's entitled Miniatures. Sternum to glass, the boy listens small birds congregating out the window in storm gutters, branches of small trees, acid tababuya, crepe myrtle barely budding. The birds flit back and forth, bring dead things to straining throats. Their song is quarrelsome. The boy is stiff, hidden by nothing as he looks. From another room, kitchen sounds and steam, smell of frying onions. Then his father screaming, serve it, I don't give a damn, she's not home yet, amidst the gentle tapping of spoons and pot lids, water running. Lily May, finishing the saute pans, she and the table set for 5.30 sharp, routine. The embroidered tablecloth, cutlery engraved with an S, four places, four square on mahogany. 
He is framed by a clutch of fine ivory miniatures by mostly unknown painters, prim, meticulous, mostly forgotten sitters, a solace to his father, their beauty, their oddity, and the painting by Monet, a small landscape of quite pale watercolor, another by Utrillo. In the center, the boy stares into blind light, wants simply for his mother to come home, to not lose control of her legs, the car, what he fears most. Wants the room not to be his harness. He gasps and puts a hand to the window, 5.30 sharp. As so often before, she stays out from her sick bed, glommed time for gossip with sales girls and buying dresses she's unlikely to wear, to be closeted, unseen. But we hang the room and star flare over waves, pictures unframed, loosed pigments made flesh. Rewrite the tale, I tell him, look again. Thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. And uh, for those of you who know Jeffrey's work, dear friends um, from Emma Press, remember that uh, to check it out. So, um, shall we um, now? Uh, would you, Wendy? Wendy, I think you mentioned that you have a poem to share with us. Yeah. Just read my one poem. Um, it's about the body. All my poetry is focused around the body. In ruby jeweled underwear. Little wine glass pulled out of nowhere. A party trick. This magic is best practiced alone. Suction, suck me. All sounds the same pulled out. A fuck come to nothing but this empty womb. My cup made from silicon filled with thick octopus's ink. I use it to highlight the dates where we failed. Dressed in ruby jeweled underwear, I hold the cup up to the bedside light. Sediment sinks to its knees, a voyeur watching, your head tented underneath my dress. Cotton embossed clouds turn to red sky tonight. The light of morning, legs high in air, my glass is upright, this is porn like. Only the old towel lets this image down. Your face drinks me. Blitz to liquid, a tipped velvet cake in the toilet bowl. Dead cell smoothie dribbles down. Refused entry on this monthly occasion. Feel the urge to inhale the smell of my own artisan waste. I hold the warm hand of tiny ridged cup. Fingers interlinked with the molecules of mist aim. Flushed clean, a smell of defrosting meat remains. The stem of the cup that cradled a could-be baby holds now a single closed tulip yet to unfold. I notice white flecks on bud. The cup is slick with arousal. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, very lovely. Um, I know that uh, just to mention Wendy's um, starting, uh, as I believe, um, um, with a MA in creative writing in Oxford Brooks um, the, in the next semester and um, congratulations on that and um, I know that you've been traveled you've traveled a lot um, as a, before and has just started writing quite a lot and intensively um, so thanks for sharing your work um, and next we will have um, Anne and Anne Bailey would you like to um, in, uh, read us one poem? Thank you very much it's great to be here loving all the all the poems. Um, I'm very happy to have a chance to read this poem. It's called In the Dream. If it's about language, I suppose it's about the language of dreams. In the Dream. I open the door, eager to greet my son after a long separation. I open the door. He is a baby, but he is also a bullet. He shoots in. I feel the air displaced smell the metallic heat. The bullet spins. It is a guided missile. It swings from side to side. It is searching, gathering itself. I sense the thrust. It has hungry eyes. In slow motion, it pauses in mid-air. 
It is wearing red dungarees. I let the door stay open, close my mouth, cover my heart with my arm. Thank you. Thank you, and um, wonderful to hear that. And um, I think you have a, a pamphlet coming out with Emma Press at the end of this year. So the title is called what? It's, it's going to be called What the House Taught Us. Mm, wonderful. Thank Thank you. Thanks for reading to us. Um, so um, it, what a treat to hear such a diverse range of um, different voices and um, kind of contemplation and language. And um, thanks to all of you. And um, now we are really delighted also to um, welcome um, Sean for sharing his um, latest, latest work from his um, very exciting collection. Um, yeah, right, uh, read very well, <laughs> Sick Fan Sifu. And uh, so um, thanks for um, coming along. And um, some of you might already know quite well Sean Mai Khan. He's, uh, he's a Glasgow based poet and performer. His pamphlet, um, You Are Mistaken, won the Rialto Open Poetry um, Competition 2016. And this uh, latest collection, Sick Fan Sifu, Glass True was um, published in April 2021 by Verve Poetry Press. He has worked with Speculative Books as well and the National Theatre of Scotland. And he holds a degree from University of Roehampton and UEA University of East Anglia. So I welcome um, Sean for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, it's a real delight to be here. Uh, so yes, I'm gonna read some poems from um, Sifan Glashko. It's a book very much inspired by the last five years of my life, around about since I've moved to Glasgow, which um, is a city that I moved to thinking it would be temporary and then I've ended up staying. Um, it's a city that has affected me greatly in terms of how I see language and how I see food and migration, which are all sort of topics that come up frequently in my work. Uh, and so a lot of the poems in this collection are therefore about language and food and migration. Um, and I'm going to start off with one that's just called Chinatown, and it does contain some Scots Gaelic in it, um, Glasgow being, you know, sort of the biggest uh, centre uh, in Scotland for the revival of the Scottish Gaelic language. Um, so it contains two Gaelic words. The first one is the Gaeltacht, which is the Gaelic term for the Highlands. And then there's the Gholtacht, which is the Gaelic term for the Scottish Lowlands. Although in a literal sense, it actually means place of foreigners. So this is Chinatown. This place was built by migrants. Therefore, it's ours. They came from the Galtacht. They came from the Galtacht. Sometimes I wonder what my Gungung would have thought had he been given the chance to visit. He had lived in other cities built by migrants, Hong Kong, Liverpool, Bradford. I like to think that if he had been given the chance, he would have liked it, but who can know for sure? When he first arrived in the UK, I don't know what Glasgow would have been like. Chinatown here opened in 1992, the year after I was born. I moved here three years after he died. This place was built by migrants. And we have been eating here ever since. So um, a lot of, uh, a lot of my sort of worldview on language, um, as a lot of the previous poets have alluded to, um, comes through sort of moving, migration, uh, and my family, and the sort of history of my family um, moving around places. My my maternal grandparents uh, migrated to the UK in the 50s from Hong Kong. 
And this next poem I'm going to read uh, is about my relationship to um, language in many ways, especially they were the only ones who ever spoke to me um, pretty much exclusively in Hakka Chinese. Um, so I never really learned much Cantonese or, or any, any of those kind of languages. Uh, and so this next poem is kind of uh, about my relationship with, with that and it's called Bye Bye. In Hong Kong Cantonese, bye bye is how you informally say goodbye. Having never gone to Chinese school, I can't remember how I know this. I only went to English school, which means that the only language I know is English. Currently I'm learning Gaelic. It just seems suddenly interesting to me one day, despite or perhaps because of the current limited number of practical applications for the language. After all, I don't know anyone who only speaks Gaelic without English. In Gaelic, to say goodbye, you could say Martian Lave or Martian Late or the more informal Thierry. Which one you use is partly determined by your social status in relation with who you are saying goodbye to. The last time I was in Hong Kong, I made a real effort to say bye bye to everyone there I knew I wouldn't see again for a long time. In a bar near the Mong Kok MTR station, they were playing Goodbye is the Saddest Word by Celine Dion. I don't think I'd heard it before, but right there in the bar, it moved me. One of the first things I learned in Gaelic is how to say where I am from. Ha, me, ah, and the place name. In order to practice this, I of course had to pick a place I was from. I started off with Ha Mi A Glasgow, for I am from Glasgow, which is where I live. Then I went with Ha Mi A Sasain, for I am from England, which is where I was born. Then Ha Mi A Hong Kong. Goodbye is the saddest word by Celine Dion ends with the lyrics till we meet again until then goodbye, which seems to imply that her version of a goodbye is not a forever goodbye, more of a see you soon or chiori in drasta. I like this version of goodbye the best, especially the way Celine Dion says it, it makes me really believe it. When I tried to speak Hong Kong Cantonese in Hong Kong, people spoke English back to me instead, clearly understanding how inept I was. Since that trip, I haven't learned any more Hong Kong Cantonese, although I am enjoying Gaelic instead. And while it does feel that I haven't been back to where I'm from in years now, perhaps that's for the best. This next one is called Tinto Tapas. It's one of the poems in the collection that's named after uh, a local restaurant. Um, this particular restaurant is about 20 or 30 minute walk from me and it's sort of a tapas bar basically. So this is tap Tinto Tapas. Sometimes I have thoughts like, I wish I knew more about Spanish food. And then I wonder if thinking like that is culturally insensitive, especially since I'm always telling people that Chinese food doesn't really exist as a thing. In the same way that British food doesn't really exist as a thing. And maybe that's the same with Spanish food. In fact, I know it probably is, yet somehow my brain is still stuck in that way of thinking. As if things should always be defined so broadly, like, yes, okay, so British food consists of lots of different cuisines, but at the same time, if you say a Sunday roast, most people would know that you meant a British Sunday roast. In the same way that if you said fan, most people would know that you meant Chinese fan. But anyway, all I'm saying is I've never eaten Spanish food that I haven't liked, and I'm sorry that I don't know more about it. This next one's called Greg's. One day some rando in the queue tells me that what you order is dependent entirely on your personality type. I asked them to explain so they did. 
If you order a sausage roll, then it means you're classy, elegant, no nonsense. If you order a steak bake, then it means you're deep thinking, complex, warm. If you order a chicken bake, then it means you're artsy, professional, lucky. A bean and cheese melt means you're fun, kinky and lighthearted. A beef pasty means you're morbid, energetic, hopeful. A pizza slice means that you always want to be in the middle of it all. A vegan sausage roll means you're cool, loving and life affirming. A sandwich means you're gentle, anxious, trusting. And a salad or a soup means that you're mysterious or possibly untrustworthy. And as I placed my own order, I found myself thinking that maybe the Randall was right. I mean, who's to say where exactly it is that these things really do come from? I think one of the reasons why uh, food interests me so much um, in, relation to, in relationship to identity and migration is because there is um, there are real issues and topics and conversation starters around food to do with ownership and uh, who owns what food uh, and the, this idea of authenticity and this idea of adapting um, and where food comes from. And this next poem is uh, another one about a restaurant. Um, this particular one is about a Lebanese restaurant. It's called Biblos Cafe. My first time having fataya was with you. You were the one who brought it up. You asked if I had ever tried Lebanese pizza and I said, what? My fataya came with spinach on top, which I loved. Yours had bits of some kind of cheese. Honestly, there were nothing like pizza except for the part of it, which was a dough topped with things. Suddenly a memory is evoked of pizza eaten on the other side of the world, the burning smell of durian atop a thick layer of yellow plastic melt, an Italian flag outside the entrance still entangled from recent typhoon winds. It was beautiful and the next night we went back again and then again. I will never forget how, as we left into the chill drizzle that last evening above us, a neon sign glowed, and I swear the word authentic and authentic Lebanese cuisine flickered or winked, although then again it could have just been a trick of the light. Um... I'm gonna do uh, a couple more now um, that are more to do with, um, well, this one, this particular one is about to, to the language. Uh, once again, it's about my, my maternal grandparents. They were a real influence on my life um, and they continue to be even now. Um, and this particular one is, it's, it's called Yabba Dabba Do. Uh, named after the um, the Flintstones uh, and Fred Flintstone's um, catchphrase on that. Uh, I used to watch it as a kid um, with my grandfather. So this one's called Yabba Dabba Do. Your tombstone is simpler than the other Chinese ones in the Anglican cemetery. No fancy vertical calligraphy to go alongside the English detailing age of death or words like beloved. A photographic inlay depicting you as you were in your 70s, a couple decades ago now, but still living. Just down the road in your old house near Asda. Around the time when I was still small enough to sit with you in your chair with the TV on loud watching Fred Flintstone slide down a Diplodocus tail, break into a huge smile, shout his catchphrase, which we would always join in with, Yabba, Dabba, do. I had never heard you speak English like that before. How did you do it? Sometimes I wonder how much of the TV we watched back then you really understood. 
and how much of it was just you copying the sounds that I reacted to the most. But does it matter? We laughed so much that your fake teeth fell out and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. You were buried with them, I was told. Just in case you would need them in the next world. Eventually in the cemetery, it's my turn to pay my respects and I get told to light three incense sticks, then bow three times while saying a prayer. As I do my bows, I don't feel like I have enough Chinese in my vocabulary to do the prayer properly. But instead, a different word forms in my mind. <clears throat> so I'm going to finish with um, this one that uh, I wrote last year on Tomb Sweeping Day, uh, Qingming Festival, uh, the day when um, traditionally uh, you would pay respects to ancestors, those who have come before. Uh, and obviously last year I was stuck, um, stuck. Um, I was here in Glasgow and I couldn't, couldn't go see my family. Um, and I was thinking a lot about this, about, about family. I was thinking a lot about um, connections between generations and you know how how different cultures can maintain these connections um and you know for instance you know something like the Qingming festival is quite direct it's very much you know a day set aside to general genuinely you know pay respects and look after what the ancestors have left behind and if there's any kind of equivalent of that in uh, british or scottish culture uh and yeah anyway that's sort of just a bit of a tangent but um yeah so sort of, you know all these thoughts are coming out and i ended up writing this poem um that that was about my grandparents and their takeaway tomb sweeping day 2020 glasgow the thoughts of my popo and gungum in england i tried to imagine once what it would be like living over half your life without being fluent in the local language. How much more intelligent you'd have to become at things such as social cues and body language, at reading expressions more times correctly than incorrectly. If you failed, then the consequences could be... All my life, I thought I had a slick imagination for that sort of thing. Even as a kid, I would flick through the world atlas, looking up faraway places and think about what life may be like over there, what kind of food they might eat, what language they might speak, if there would be anyone there who looked like me. And meanwhile, down the road at the front desk of the spring bamboo, they would sit together at the same time every day in a calm silence, thinking about inconsequential things, but doing so in Hagar and there would be no need for words. Because she knew that he had already put the change in the till. And he knew that she had already flicked the switch from the fryers from the circle diagram to the one line diagram. And they both knew that in a few minutes time they would unlock the front door together before flipping the plastic sign from the red side, reading closed, to the blue one, reading open. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, this is brilliant. And I think like, as you can see from the comments on the chat, that like so much resonance, uh, like um, how it's, you know, uh, how you hail from like such different places and combining that kind of multicultural spirit to us and um, that sense of language and place and uh, food, like that sense of humor, that, Kind of radiate from your language. Um, it's just brilliant. Um, really looking forward to, to kind of uh, reading through the collection more. Um, um, and I've got the link there. So uh, thanks again. And now um, I guess like we're all kind of like with some questions I'm sure about um, all, all of your work. Um, would 
would there be like any questions from the audience about, um, you know, uh, Cynthia, Jason's, um, Sean's work? I'm so sorry that Romelin is supposed to come, but I think unfortunately she's not able to join us for this time. We'll try to see if we can um, have her read in future sessions. So um, if anyone has some question, feel free to drop it in the chat. Oh yes, I already have a question actually, I think. Um, um, would Tina has a, a question for? Would Would you like to? Would you like to say the question yourself? Um, yeah, yep. The question I like to ask the poets, especially those who are brought up sort of bilingual or spoke different languages. Did you feel that you had to sort of suppress your native language in lieu for something else? So, like myself, um, I was brought up when I was very young, spoke Hakka, and then as I got older, it became Cantonese was very much that you should be speaking, and then after that, it was like. English and then, and then, and then the, now the Cantonese, the family from Hong Kong, then it should be Mandarin. So it's always like, and then, and then, and then, and then born in Glasgow. So when, you, when I was young, you speak kind of, I was kind of brought up to believe that Scots was slang. So that wasn't a language. So we get told off at school, we say I, and then, and then as I got older, there's a whole revival. And then you realize, so, so you kind of feel there's a sort of suppression of your native tongue. Thank you very much for the question. Anyone? Um... Sean? Sure. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I guess, that that's when, when I sort of alluded to how um, moving to Glasgow has affected me. That's one of the things that actually um, it stirred in me a lot was that previous to that, I, I, I knew that I had this interest in sort of other languages. Um, and I knew that I always felt quite guilty that I didn't spend more of my time trying to learn Hagga properly or trying to learn Cantonese or anything like that. Um, and then actually moving to uh, moving to Glasgow and living in a place that is really sort of um, interested in holding on to its language and interested in the, the revelry around language. Um, you know, I heard something once that it's the Glaswegian accent is is actually flourishing uh, compared to most other British accents that are actually sort of slowly dying out. Um, and that sort of side of things compared to also um you know the the uh scots and gaelic and all of these sort of things and that made me think more about other languages that i had relationships to including Hagga and cantonese um and so yeah i think you know that before then it never really struck me as something that i could put in my poems or something that would be interesting to write about in my poems um but then sort of living here it has definitely made me much more interested in exploring that side of things uh, and so in that sense, it's not so much suppressing as actually sort of flourishing. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's a really, if you don't mind, I'd love to answer that question. I think it's a really interesting question. And and one, um, I'm really glad Sean went first because I was like, oh man, how am I going to answer this? Um, for, in my own experience, it was less about, I think there was part of me that almost suppressed my own language, but also the degree to which that language is kind of, suppressed or held back before it even got to me. So um, when I was really young, I grew up in Beijing. So my sister and I grew up speaking Mandarin, like a really Beijing kind of Mandarin. And when we moved back to the States, we got put in Chinese school. So I was this like 14 year old kid in with all the other like three and four year olds in Chinese Sunday school, basically illiterate, trying to relearn Mandarin. Um, and it was always a really strange experience because my mother didn't speak Mandarin, she spoke Hokkien, but she never raised, you know, us with Hokkien. So it always felt like even within the different, you know, not even Chinese dialects, but different kind of, yeah, different languages, we were almost not able to connect and not able to speak to each other. And um, I think about the, you know, Sean mentioned the way that we experience language, but it's very different to the way potentially that it shows up in our poems. Um, and in my poetry, I found it, even writing this collection actually quite difficult to weave in some of that language. So Chinese characters do appear in the collection. And I was quite nervous doing that because I don't read Chinese very well. It's been literally decades since I've you know, studied it properly academically. And I always felt that I wasn't quite sure how it would come out, whether it would be Hokkien, which is kind of although I don't understand it, I feel like I've been so immersed in it in listening to my mother and her family speak or whether it would be these really kind of clipped Beijing Mandarin tones, which 
is very, very disconnected to my mother, my family, my heritage, but is a language that I feel much more natural in. Um, I feel even uncomfortable talking through it right now. Like I get that sense of displacement and being in between language. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's kind of my response to your really powerful question, which is to what extent are we suppressing in ourselves and to what extent has that language already been filtered in a way that it almost arrives to us quite distorted before we even have a chance to kind of wrap our heads around it. Um, and then being kind of Malaysian Chinese in Edinburgh where there aren't a lot of other people around me, the way that I categorize myself as Chinese is so kind of hybridized already is my very rambling answer to your very succinct question. <laughs> Um, Jason, have you got something to yeah. add? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of chagrin that we will experience because, you know, um, I've lived in Hong Kong for 15 years and my wife and my son, who is eight years old quite soon, will say, Daddy, let me say Gong Gong Noa, right? And <laughs> castigate me because my Cantonese is so poor um, and my Mandarin is not much better. Um, when I grew up, I, my, my parents, just, just like Cynthia and Sean here, they spoke Hakka and Hokkien. And in Malaysia, in, in Borneo especially, you have such a strange melting pot of languages. You have Malay, you have Kadazanduzun, you have English, right? Which obviously we, we, we had an accent at the time. I find that I, I'm reliving this conundrum of language through my son, especially because I struggle because, you know, he goes to a local school and, you know, he has to try and do his homework in, in Chinese and I can't help him because his Chinese far outstrips mine. But whenever I, I, I walk through and I hear Cantonese or I hear Putonghua, <clears throat> as, we, as we call Mandarin in Hong Kong, it reminds me of some of the language um, immersion that I had in Malaysia, which was imperfect. It was not done in, in kind of classical, you know, retroflex Beijing or Putonghua, but there's, there's enough of it there that it permeates through into your consciousness. So I find that when I was writing about my childhood, bits and pieces of different languages would come to me. And sometimes it would be Malay, sometimes it would be Hakka, sometimes it would be Hokkien. <laughs> and I would struggle to articulate that kind of polyglossia, I think. The idea that we can actually get down words which come from a particular linguistic origin and mean something. I think that becomes, that becomes very difficult to do in the Malaysian experience because all these words, they coexist. My father could never speak a single sentence in one language. He'd have to have four or five of them jumbled up. And that probably explains why my, one, my, my father gave up teaching me any kind of Chinese language because he just couldn't teach me one language. That's my answer. That's brilliant. Um, really lovely to know how much, you know, how all your journeys with language, oh, languages actually, um, are like, um, and the convergences. Um, I, I just noticed also um, Sue mentioned a question which is um, kind of connected to this topic before we go on to Alice's question is about uh, the use of Gaelic. Um, I presume that's for Sean. Uh, how difficult do you find it to learn and read this? Uh, so learning to uh, read and write it is, hasn't been that difficult. Uh, it's been a lot easier than I thought it would be um, because it's quite, a, it's quite a consistent language. I'm um, sort of, you know, in my learning, I'm getting to some of the more complex sentences now, and I, I'm, that's when I'm struggling a bit. Uh, but it, because it's a language that is sort of um, quite minimal still, um, I, I struggle a lot with speaking it um, a lot. Uh, and the few sort of verbal conversations I've tried to have with people uh, haven't gone that well. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting the difference between sort of learning to write and read as opposed to speaking, and it reminds me a lot of my um, my mum's relationship with uh, with Hagga in that she can speak it perfectly fine, but she never learned to write a single character. Um, so I think you know that that boundary there is still something that I've yet to. Uh, attempt to cross with Gaelic, but it's one that I'm looking forward to attempting again at some point. Thanks, brilliant to know. Yeah, you must be, yeah, so gifted in learning languages. Um, 
So I, I also wonder, Alice, would you like to share your question? Uh, that's a very fascinating question. Or shall I read it to you? Okay, maybe I will, um, I will, I will read out Alice's question. So uh, no, I've, I've come back. Oh, I just oh, got it here. You're back. <laughs> I just hit the wrong button. <laughs> so yeah, I was interested in um, Jason's and Cynthia's experience of writing Malaysia and Hong Kong into the English narrative, and making places which English language history has marginalised the centre of the story again, because that seems to me a really political act, given that the sort of English language or British empire culture profited from those territories, but also disregarded them as sort of centers of being and actually to kind of, to write them into narrative seemed, seemed a very important act sort of politically as well as, cre as creatively. And I wondered if you felt that both of you. That is such a hard question to answer. I could probably speak for three hours about this, but <laughs> I don't know, Cindy, if you want to go first, and then I can probably, um, you know, Oh, my lift. goodness. Uh, <laughs> trying to formulate some of my thoughts on this on the fly. Um, yes, it felt important politically and personally, because when is politics not personal? Um, yeah, I'm struggling to answer this question. I, I guess... <laughs> When I was thinking about writing Malaysia into the poems, I was very conscious that I can't speak for all Malaysians. I can't speak for all people from Borneo or Sarawak. I was born there and we moved there after I was six weeks old. So I'm, I'm almost slightly uneasy being the, the Malaysian poet as it were. But what was really important to me is telling stories through the prism of family and individuals. So, you know, my mother as the character looms very large in the collection as do uncles, etc. Because I felt like I couldn't speak for an entire country. I can only really speak to kind of personal experiences. Um, but you're right. It was, it was important for me to center it and quite literally it is at the center of this book. Um, because I don't often see those stories being told. I don't often see those narratives being told. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm not very eloquent today, <laughs> sorry for a poet. Um, but I think it's a really, I think it's a really tough question, a really important question. I'm sure Jason will have much more articulate things to say on this. Well, I think, you know, if I start going into academic gobbledygook, then it will be even <laughs> less eloquent. Um, it's interesting because I have been writing an article about this idea of what it means to be a diasporic poet. And I talk about it through the prism of Malaysia because I was, my co-writer was, was also um, in the Malaysian. Um, both Hong Kong and Malaysia, as, as you, as probably everybody knows, they were, they were once colonies of the British Empire. Um, but language is, the English language is still so important there as um, a language of as a class-based marker for one, right? And in Hong Kong, that is still the case. Um, English has been supplanted by Mandarin as the second language of Hong Kongers. And, you know, with, with what we're seeing with Beijing really kind of trying to renationalize Hong Kong, I think that's the word we're allowed to use now. Um, English, we, we worry, we worry that that, that will become um, less and less prevalent. But the, Insofar as how I operate as a as what we call an anglophone poet in Hong Kong, there's always a divide between the Cantonese language poets and the English language ones. Jenny will, will be able to nod and explain a lot of this um, fairly well. When it comes to Malaysia, it's, it's even stranger because um, a lot of the most prominent writers and poets of the English language in Malaysia, essentially they, they felt like they had to leave the country. Um, after the policies that were put in by the by the Malaysian government, so to to use English as a as a choice of language is it creates your own sense of marginality, and we talk about the importance of using English with respect to the fact that it was part of the the colonial apparatus um, of the time, but it also it creates its 
you know, its own conditions and constraints. And I think that's the interesting thing about how, you know, when I, when I kind of phone into the UK and I say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm a British poet, but I'm based in Hong Kong, but I have a childhood in Malaysia. The English language has always followed me. And yet it becomes a, a, a status of, of marginality in those co conditions where you've got governments actively trying to um, fight back against the colonial condition, but it also becomes a language of opportunity because we can still talk to these, these kind of, um, you know, these kind of centers of power, right? Most of the, the poets in Hong Kong, they know the poets in the UK and America, right? The same cannot be said of poets in the UK thinking of poets back in Hong Kong. So the English language is, is tremendously political in, in these places. Um, and there's, I suspect there's a certain amount of anxiety that we have, that I have, not being based in the UK when I, when I use it. Um, but that is the only language that I can use um, as one of expression. So I don't know if I've answered the question. I don't, do, I don't know if between Cynthia and I, we've tried to give you some kind of um, answer. Um, but what do you think, Alice? I mean, how, how do you read the, the, the situation? How do you read the poetries of, of other I mean, people? You... I, I have a second language, which is French. So I understand the sort of dual language thing. And I actually write a bit between the two and then move it all back into English. Um, so I, I have a sort of suppressed language, but I just feel, I mean, I, I really loved hearing Cynthia talking about Malaysia describing, and I love reading in Kit Fan's work, in uh, Jennifer's work, um, in Mary Jean Chan's work. I mean, it's, it's somewhere that I am hungry to understand um, or two countries in LQ's work, both because I feel implicated as someone of a partially English heritage in the current situation, because there's no doubt that, we, you know, those of us are, but also simply to know what's going on. You know, something like Russian, I don't have, so I have to take that through the medium of translation. But if someone's writing about a distant country in a language that's my first language, I can really engage with it. And that feels like a sort of huge privilege and also an act of rectification. You know, I'm really conscious historically of the sort of decades of denial. You know, you can only exploit a country economically if you say that its citizens are of less worth than your own. And so they can be denied everything. Um, and it, you know, it just seems very important that my dog speaking doglish. So <laughs> I'll just let her go and talk doglish. Sorry, but um, yeah, no, but it, I mean, it just, it just seems something I'm very grateful for, something I'm very interested in. And, you know, and, and that's why I keep showing up for these things because I feel I'm getting so much out of it. Um, Thank you so much, Alice. That's it's a wonderful interpretation of the whole, yeah, like the kind of tension between um, languages and in the knowledge and languages knowledge. Um, and thanks to all the poets, um, just fascinating. And as Jason said, like it can easily go on for hours, but um, it's wonderful. So I wonder if it's also a good point um, to, um, to see if, well, how about like um, the, the books that you've been reading? I think uh, all three of you, you know, you must have like uh, all these literary influences that change you um, in terms of what you, how you articulate your ideas. And um, is it kind of like, uh, would you like to shed light on what, you, what you're reading lately maybe? Do I wanna go first? I'm happy to jump in. Uh, sorry, I've got a cat who's very insistent and like has um, a separation anxiety. Uh, literary influences. Um, so recently, well, I guess about a year ago, um, yeah, I mentioned her before, but Caroline Bird's The Air Year from Carcanet is such an exquisite collection um, and has really impacted the way I write because it's so different to the way I write. It's the kind of poetry that I read and I go, oh, I wish I could have written that. She's got this amazing, I feel like reading her poetry is like drinking Baraka. It's like effervescent and it's energy filling and it's sparkling and it's witty and it's, um, 
playful in a way that really takes you by surprise when then kind of like the right hook comes in the last line of the poem. So if you haven't yet read The Airy Year by Caroline Bird, um, it won all the prizes last year because it's very good. So yeah, I, 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 would, I would recommend that very, very much so. Um, yeah, I'll we'll go with that. Thank you. Um, Sean? Yeah, so um, for me, uh, the sort of the, the major book that I've been in love with uh, and I'm sort of reading over and over again obsessively um, around now is Old Bits by Victoria Chang, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure people know about. But uh, yeah, um, sort of earlier this year, I found myself going through a bereavement and uh, discovering or rereading uh, some of the poems and obits um, that are all about uh, grief and um, that sort of thing. It's, it's re really sort of something to connect with and something to hold on to. And um, just the use of language there, the, you know, the, the way that by using form and um, sort of the nature of poetry uh, Victoria Chang is able to sort of take some of the language around bereavement, uh, around things like um, healthcare or um, paperwork or things like that, uh, or memories, and to then just sort of turn it into something else, something other, and then that as well as sort of you know a background in um, lang other languages and other heritages, uh, just sort of it all comes together, and it's been a really important book for me over the last few months, and. Um, I think, you know, I think poetry really matters um, most at those points in your life when you're looking for connection out there and there's no nothing, it feels like there's no sort of ability to connect with. And for me, um, Obit is a book that I have, that has enabled me to feel more connected to the world and to myself. So I highly, highly recommend it if you haven't already read it. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, I love that collection as well. Very well. Um, Jason, let's go. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm writing down everything that people are recommending. Um, it's interesting for me because you know when I when I was writing this book, um, a lot of the ideas are based in Malaysia and then the UK, but I wrote them down. They were in my head, but I wrote them down when I was in Hong Kong, and I was very reluctant at the time to try and read what I would consider then my peers. Um, so Malaysian writers or Hong Kong writers. And I kind of stuck with, um, you know, some of the, the more well-known male writers that I'd grown up with, because I wanted to kind of harness that for my own poetic voice. But in the past five years, definitely I've, I've tried to kind of read poetry that has a very different core sensibility. And in, in future collections, I hope to have something that features more of a kind of pan-Asian aesthetic. So I've been reading a lot of poetry that, that's based on, this, you know, the Japanese concept of mujo, of, in, of impermanence, and this idea of there being some kind of spirit um, kind of operating behind the scenes. And on top of that, because of, because of what's happening in Hong Kong and, and how I feel that there are problems with how the English language poetry scene um, collectively tries to represent Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I go back to people like P.K. Leung, um, P.K. Leung is, I think, the most important writer that's ever come out of Hong Kong and criminally underappreciated, very, very talented bilingual writer. He translated a lot of his own stuff. But his poetry is very much um, based on the simple things, you know, basically sipping tea and, and, and staring out at, at the people. And it's very difficult to try and represent a place like Hong Kong because it's so built up, because there's so much to see. Um, and what I wanted to do with the, the Lost City, this, this, this book like poem, is I wanted to try and inhabit that local sensibility because I know that I'm an outsider looking in. Um, I'm not somebody who's born and bred. Um, but I also, at the same time, go back to um, some of the poets that made me want to write poetry about myself, about the state of being um, part of the colonies. And that, that would be somebody like Derek Walcott, who, who's also written a lot of epic poetry. And, you know, you can love the poetry and hate the man or, or vice versa and, and all the rest of it. But I find that there's so much that I get when I combine 
what I read from my English language poets, you know, the can canonical writers, and then I switch, and then I read a Malaysian writer like Kule Grassi. So there's a there's a there's a fellow Sarawak writer who writes in Iban called Kule Grassi, who's who's winning all these kind of awards in the Southeast Asian region, and then there's P.K. Lum, who you know he's a fantastically gifted poet. Um, and unfortunately, he died before all of these kind of movements to kind of, you know, change the current status quo of Hong Kong came about. So I feel there's a kind of burden upon me to represent my local peers rather than to kind of go back to, you know, the kind of the poets that I grew up with, the, the, the Heaney's and the Yates and the Walcott's and, and the Ted Hughes. So these are, you know, this is the kind of moment that I'm at and I want to try and push it as far as I can. Um, and hopefully my, my writing itself will change and will be more mature as a result of that kind of cross um, pollination. Thank you, Jason. Um, that's uh, a wonderful um, sort of um, list of poets to, or poetry to, to look yeah, at. Sorry, I couldn't give you just oh. one. <laughs> sorry? I said I couldn't give you just one, but if I oh, could, yeah. I would recommend uh, P.K. Yeah. Lung Very. in the chat. Inspiring, and I will probably ask um, all of you to kind of give me the, you know, the list again, and I will po post it on our Facebook as well. Um, it's just, you know, definitely worth, um, uh, um, you know, uh, looking out for all these uh, works that from um, different places um, that, or you know, writing different languages even, that will uh, kind of open up our new ways of looking at the world and. You know, evoking a sense of place. Um, so, thank you for that. And I, I think like um, um, our dear poets have prepared a very short poem. Um, each of you to to end the um, you know, the lovely event. Um, I would um really like to invite you all to share with us, just to kind of like bring us back to your work. Um, maybe you know, um, who would like to start first? Um, which um, how about is Jason? Would you like to? Um, read first, or Jason or Sean, yeah. Yeah. whoever is ready. <laughs> In... Okay. Um, <clears throat> read. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah there, there's there's so many poems I want to read in response to Cynthia and Sean, right? But there's you know there's only one. So perhaps what I'll do is I'll I'll read the poem that I think you mentioned on Twitter, Jenny, the one about um, basically being forced as a school kid to stand out under the sun and recite. The national anthem. There's a lot of poems in my collection that talk about this being forced to pay allegiance to a particular nation. Um, and I have it with Malaysia, I have it with the Malay, I have it with England, I have it with Britain, and of course I have it with the Celestial Kingdom now. So anyway, this one is based in Malaysia, School Parade. In the Padang, morning sweat glistening on our brows, eyes squinting devilishly at our national sun, we sang our hearts out of tune as the flags rose solemnly above our heads to clutter up the skies. First, the national, state, then school anthem, all blurred into one long song which tapered off with the principal's sonorous drone as monitors leered at us from the back and mosquitoes tagged us on the rank fields. Throughout August, we learned of Madeka, how the British were fought and overthrown by all our patriotic forefathers. I too yelled deaf to the invaders, then bit my tongue for fear of home reprisals. I wanted to fly kites or thrash marbles, but as the celebrations gathered storm, there was no let up. Shirts were inspected, shoes acquired spit, and we scuffled round the field, chained together in one labor. Such songs I would never forget, such pomp, the way trumpets blundered through untrained ears, our heads chasing madness, each with eyes fixed on the distance, conspiring to evade service to school and its oppressive rule. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. This is such a beautiful, it's one of my favorite poems in your collection. Um, Sean, do you have a... Um... Yeah, yeah, I can go. Uh, I'll do a quick one that's um, it's called Lan Zhao Noodle and it's named after <clears throat> handmade, uh, hand-pulled uh, 
noodle restaurant in Glasgow. Banjao noodle. The thing about places where you can see into the cooking area slash kitchen is that you really can see it all. The amount of physical effort that every single movement and dish requires, the gravity of a cleaver falling precisely along with the movement of a hand, the tensing of fingers slash eyes when kneading dull, the steam rising from a pan filled with you can't tell what. I want to know what strong feelings it evokes in you to watch your food being made rather than have it appear from a distant corner. Could it be a nostalgia for something, a yearner, a yearning, a hunger for connection to another space time? Meanwhile, far away in a kitchen on the other side of the world, a small boy watches with huge disbelieving eyes as his grandfather quickly slices noodles out of dough before flicking them up into the biggest pan the boy will ever see. He knows too that it's almost time. Wonderful. Next time I have those noodles, I'm gonna remember your poem. <laughs> Um, Cynthia. Yeah. Um, this poem is called Sayang Sayang. Uh, that's a Malay word that has a, a constellation of meanings. So it feels appropriate for a language themed event. Sayang Sayang. Noun, love. I have lived with this word for 28 years and only now is it taking root in my mouth. See also beloved, sweetheart. Noun, waste. The thought of throwing food away, the last bite of beef noodles gone rubbery and cold. Go on, don't make me save it. See also regretful loss. Noun, pity. All this fruit left on the branch, steeping in its own rot. Who knows how long we have before a plastic bag of windfall rambutans turns into sweet slop. See also, we'll eat it anyway. Yes, darling. My dearest, love is always dear. Love is never a waste. Love is eating scraps for fear of waste. Love is chiding you to finish your plate. Love, eat up. Eat up, love. What a pity. Such a shame to waste love. Love, how much love we've wasted. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Beautiful. And let's um, give a big clap to all of our poets um, tonight. Just, uh, not tonight, like this late afternoon. <laughs> but it's just really what a treat to, to kind of like have that sort of vibrant kind of just a position of languages and ideas that um, I think like there's such a close dialogue between all your work that really um, kind of gets us thinking and makes me want to write. <laughs> and uh, really, I, I'm sure that everyone enjoys a lot and from the kind of lovely responses that you have seen in the chat. Um, so thank you everyone for, you know, such a, you know, beautiful, um, you know, e uh, reading event and um, really looking forward to also reading all these poems and rereading them again. And um, thanks also to people who have read tonight, uh, to today. Um, and um, I will uh, share with you all like the, uh, the titles that are recommended by, um, Cynthia, uh, Sean and Jason and um, and I hope that you will um, also keep an eye on our readings uh, continue you know continue to um, you know keep poetry in our hearts and uh, for those of you who are writers um, keep writing so um, thanks again for joining us um, thank you very much thank you thank you Jenny thank you so much Jenny, so much, Jenny. and uh, Thanks, folks. Thank See you later. So enjoy your rest of your weekend. <laughs> Bye. Lovely to see you all.